and they have a voice in this country. And that is simple as the, is democracy. Nobody can, uh, uh, Father Joe referred to dissent. Dissent is also voice. It's not noise, but unfortunately, dissent is now seen to be or pictured to be or sought to be pictured as uh, noise. Constitution does not conceive of noise. It only permits or conceives, uh, only has conceived the voice. So I have my voice, otherwise I'm not a democratic, I'm not living in a democratic country. And I don't have democracy as a way of life. If I need to have a way of life, uh, as a democracy as a way of life, I need to have a voice, free voice. Uh, I'll just explain to you when I speak about the liberty. And uh, I have a space in this country. Nobody can drive me out of this country. I can move freely in this country because every inch of this country is mine. It's mine, it's nobody else. So I have a right in that uh, a, a, a right to move about in this country. There are reasonable regulations or restrictions which also I'll touch when we come to the next part of it. <laughs> Then comes secular. So democracy, so so long as uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I, I'm able to enjoy this space and noise, I can say I am living in a democratic country, India. The moment uh, my space is disturbed, the voice, my, the, the moment my voice is suppressed, I cannot say that I enjoy democracy. Enjoy, democracy is a way of life. And I cannot say that my country is democratic anymore. Come secularism. Secularism of India is uh, something unique. The popular notion of uh, secularism is that the, it's a country which uh, does not have any official religion. True, India does not have an official religion. India does not uh, belong to any religious uh, uh, denomination. Unlike our neighbor Pakistan, Pakistan constitution says the country belongs to Allah and everything is Allah. We do not say that the country belongs to any particular name of God whom all of us believe. You may have a different uh, religious uh, uh, what you call, uh, uh, affinities. And we may call, try to call, um, we may call God according to that religious affinity. But uh, we do not say that this country belongs to. You can say this church belongs to, or this temple belongs to, or this mosque belongs to A, B, C or so group or religion. But this country does not belong to any religion. All religions uh, have a, a, a free space in this country. That is secularism. And Indian secularism is unique because it welcomes the role religions can play in molding a better citizen and making him a better human person, a better human being, yes, a better person. In shaping him as a more responsible citizen and uh, in forming him as a better human being. This is the role the religion can play, is what uh, the constitution makers believed when they said India is a secular country. And this secularism is actually articulated in Article 25 of the Constitution of India. Article 25 of the Constitution of India speaks about the freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. Freedom of conscience means you know you have a, a, a free conscience in the sense your conscience cannot be uh, uh, what do you call um, unduly influenced or uh, influenced under duress either to believe or not to believe. So you are free to exercise your free will. This uh, terminology is uh, familiar to us. We have a free will. You can either believe or you can choose not to believe. You are free not to believe also. That is your freedom of conscience. But the moment you believe, you have uh, so many rights under our constitution. 
That is the speciality of secularism. That right uh, mainly are three. You can profess your faith. You can practice your faith. And you can propagate your faith. There are three P's. That's the most important uh, and crucial aspects as far as uh, freedom of religion is concerned. One, it allows you to freely profess. Yes, you can declare, you can announce, you can say, I believe in this religion. I belong to this religion. This is my religion. You can freely profess and declare to the whole country. You can practice it according to the religious uh, practices or uh, religious, uh, as, uh, what do you call the, the, the tenets. You can uh, freely practice your religion, your spiritual and other things. That is why Anishtanas, whatever way you want it, you can uh, profess it and uh, practice it publicly. You are not under the uh, regulation of anybody in as far as free practice of religion is concerned. And the most uh, uh, crucial or important aspect is you can even propagate also. Not even, you can propagate your religion. Nobody can stop you from propagating your religion. But these three rights of uh, profession, practice and propagation of your religion is subject to uh, for uh, uh, regulations or uh, subject to four, four, four restrictions, I can say, not regulations, are regulated by four restrictions. One is public order, another is health, third is morality, and uh, the fourth is uh, other fundamental rights. This Article 25 is also a fundamental right, and uh, this uh, uh, profession, practice, and propagation of uh, your religion is uh, um, in a way regulated by four uh, regulating factors, public order, um, health, morality, and other parts of the um, fundamental rights. What is public order? Anything which uh, uh, does not create a disorder, that is public order. That is why, you know, um, uh, so you cannot take out a procession violating the rights of others, etc. Because there's an order in society. The whole purpose of law is to create an order in society. So you cannot uh, disturb your public peace. You cannot public. Uh, you, you cannot publicly disturb. You cannot disturb publicly the order in society. Public order, health, health in the. Uh, if you can think about uh, sadi, etc. In the name of. Uh, Religious practice, you cannot uh, affect uh, uh, the, the health of a person. These tandris, mandras, etc. Everywhere, you know, if, if, if uh, you are led to superstitious beliefs, which you do not even strike to common sense, then actually it affects your health also. A lot of discussion in the constitutional morality on these aspects also. Uh, when we spoke about, when we discussed, the, the, the country is now discussing that uh, Sabarimala uh, uh, case also. Um, yes, I am just referring to one aspect, yes. Uh, health, uh, uh, morality. And what is morality? That also something which uh, one need to understand. When the moment you say moral, then the question of your conscience comes. And what is your conscience? A sense of uh, what is good and bad, right and wrong, proper and improper, correct and incorrect. How? In accordance with uh, the constitution. So that is what's called constitutional morality. See, I cannot say, no, I believe in uh, my conscience permits me. Suppose you cross a traffic light and the policeman stops you. You can say, no, no I did it according to my conscience. <laughs> will, you be, will, you, will you be permitted to go like that? No. Your constitution, your, your conscience does not permit you to live in this country violating the laws. 
your your conscience is a conscience which is to be formed according to the constitution and the laws made there under so it's a constitutional conscience as far as constitutional morality is concerned so long as uh, we live in this country morality and other parts of this constitution which means equality we gives a right to life that is why you know uh, article 21 um, um, steps into when where there is a violation of your uh, human rights also in the name of uh, religion in case uh, your dignity is affected always court has stepped in uh, i don't want to explain it further because it is also an aspect pending uh, in the supreme court in relation to the review in the sabrimala case of a constitutional morality so that's the beauty of indian secularism i just want to say that it is not against religion first of all understand it welcomes all religions to it recognizes the role the religion can play in uh, making a person a more responsible citizen and forming him as a better human being that is why it is welcomed it welcomed though the majority religion almost 70 more than 78% or so 75% or so people belong to one religion hindu religion but that religion is such such an such a such a such an open religion it is so open and is so inclusive that it welcomed christianity it welcomed islam it welcomed zoroastrianism it welcomed parsis it gave birth to buddhism it gave birth to jainism it gave birth to sikhism so it is so inclusive and you know it permits you know, any body to believe in any religion because it believes in vasudeva kudumbak it you know is is a is a world where you know, everybody is free to have a, uh, his own perception and choice of um, his religious path so as to achieve nirvana that's it's uh, that is why even advaita was welcomed here even there are several reformative movements also in hinduism when was uh, since i came from that place sangrajaya's place kaladi advaita was a great revolution uh, in uh, uh, hindu religion well i only want to say the true hindu uh, religious concept is so inclusive that uh, it welcomes and recognizes any religion so long as uh, it is for realization of god it doesn't matter whether you go to this temple or that temple or this church or that mosque or no anybody can have any practice of religion provided it's all for uh, uh, the realization of god as you have conceived god that's the beauty of uh, hinduism true hinduism genuine hinduism right is neither against any religion nor it is exclusively for its own religious uh, beliefs yes and that is the secularism so we have seen five pillars sovereign we have constituted india on five pillars constituting uh, factors or values sovereign socialist secular democratic republic then comes uh, then such a, a constituted country has uh, sought to secure to us what secure to us uh, justice now comes the three constitutional concept of rights three uh, rights justice which is social economic and political social justice uh, of which um, father joe in fact made uh, some introduction uh, on peace and reconciliation you know there is no peace without development there is no peace without development so the whole idea of our uh, ngos is to know to 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 develop the country develop the society develop the faculties in a man involve him in the building up of uh, the nation building of the society so that there is development the moment there is development there is peace and if there is peace there is uh, it's easy for reconciliation <coughs> it is easy for um, uh, what you call uh, uh, building up of a country 
tolerance everything so the one of the essential factors is uh, development so if there is not true development all these uh, problems will easily crop up there so that is uh, justice which is social economic and political then comes uh, equality equality also has uh, two pros equality of status and opportunity you know this equality is uh, provided and uh, dealt with under article 14 of the constitution of india it's also a fundamental right there are two fundamental rights which are available to non citizens also as otherwise uh, you, when we think of fundamental rights it's available only to the citizens but the two articles uh, or two fundamental rights covered by article 14 on equality everybody is equal before law and everybody is entitled to equal protection of law and article 21 that uh, your life and liberty cannot be taken away without uh, a procedure established by law that is your right to life and liberty so right to equality and right to life and liberty are uh, uh, rights which are available to even foreigners in india all other rights uh, coming to your freedom of speech etc 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 all those fundamental rights are available only to citizens from these two rights on equality and uh, your life uh, right to life and liberty are available to even non citizens this equality of um, status and opportunity clause of india has uh, several dimensions but for the present we need to know that this country we call our mother so mother makes no difference at all with her children no discrimination one child may be black the other child may be dwarf third child may be uh, white fourth child may be challenged physically or mentally challenged the next one may be uh, is a lazy or doesn't study the next one may be you know uh, very poor the next one may be uh, you know a girl maybe a boy then a transgender for a mother everybody is the same she does not consider somebody in terms of his worth or in terms of the worth of the child for mother the worth is that you know that child is born in her that is the worth therefore for this mother country india everyone is dear to the country it makes no difference as to whether he belongs to scheduled tribe he belongs to scheduled caste uh, the person is a female or a male or a transgender he speaks a language believe he believes in a religion he belongs to a place he belongs to a culture he belongs to a particular uh, group he has power he has money he has uh, health irrespective of your caste color creed position religion language gender everybody is equal before law and everybody is equal and right to equal protection of law and nobody is above law that is the concept of rule of law howsoever high you may be you are uh, governed by law you are under law you are governed by law that is the concept of uh, rule of law well uh, as far as equality is concerned the equal the equality concept of india or our constitution is that you know everybody irrespective of uh, all the social differences or political differences or ideological differences or religious differences or physical uh, uh, differences or material differences or differences in terms of your material or power or position you are equal before law you are entitled to same treatment you and i are the same everybody that is equality then comes the third one liberty liberty has uh, five pros so justice has three it is social economic and political equality has two which is uh, status and opportunity then comes liberty liberty of thought expression faith belief worship there's five sub pillars for this constitutional value of liberty 
liberty of thought, liberty of expression, liberty of faith, liberty of belief, liberty of worship. These are the constitutional uh, uh, con uh, values on liberty. And this we find uh, in Article 19. These are all I am speaking from the preamble, but I also I am also referring parallelly to the fundamental right as in Part 3 of the Constitution. It comes under Article 19. 19, one of the Constitution, yes, says, you know, you have a freedom of speech and expression. This freedom of speech and expression is a right. It's, it's a right without which you cannot exist. If you are a human being, you have to yawn. Your voice has come out. Otherwise, there is no point in saying that, you know, uh, that you, you are a free person. One of the definite uh, uh, factors constituting your liberty is that, you know, you have a, a free voice in this country. Nobody can close your mouth. I was uh, terribly disturbed in one of the judgments where the Supreme Court itself uh, said, you know, you shall not speak to the public on any matters. It's not constitutionally right. I have a right to criticize it. I'm saying that. It's not constitutionally right. So long as there's a lecture there, no doubt about it. It's not uncontrolled or unbridled. Article 19.2 is very specific about it. Your right of free speech and expression are controlled again by public order, health, decency, morality, contempt of court, sovereignty, integrity. Uh, those are, there are nine such uh, regulating factors as far as uh, this uh, uh, freedom of uh, speech and expression is concerned. It is uh, sovereignty, integrity of the country, security of the state, plunder relations with foreign states, public order, decency, morality, contempt, defamation, and incitement to offense. All these uh, uh, factors which should go into the, the defining limit of uh, your free speech, the Lakshman Dragon. This is the Lakshman Dragon. You cannot cross this by your right to free speech and expression. There are nine. These are the nine factors of regulating factors. Accept or uh, degross that without which, and without that, or uh, rather cross without crossing that, you have a free voice in this country. So I have seen many people speaking, and even our uh, uh, great freedom fighters so vocally said, I'm using this uh, double expression, so vocally said, between life and liberty, I will choose liberty. Paradandre Murtivine Kal Bhayanagam. Yes, that is a Malayan popular saying. See, if you are denied your liberty, it's worse than death. That's the literal translation. It's more terrifying than death. Yes, more horrifying. Yeah, more horrifying death than death. You're, you're, you, you, that you are silenced is more than horrifying. You are uh, uh, taking of your life. Because that you have a life is borne out by your free speech. Not simple life of your uh, breathing in and breathing out. Life of a meaningful existence in this country. That is uh, our liberty. That is under Article 19. Freedom of speech and expression. So we have seen three rights now in the preamble under constitutional values. Securing to ourselves three rights. First right is justice, social, economic, and political. Second is equality of uh, status and opportunity. Third is liberty uh, of uh, uh, thought, expression, faith, belief, and worship. Now the liberty comes second and comes equality, says no opportunity. And uh, assuring, that comes the fourth, fourth one. Fourth one is actually, is not a right, it's a duty. Uh, if we can correlate to the French Revolution. French Revolution, these are the three slogans. Justice, 
liberty, equality. So these are the three slogans. So these were taken as our constitutional values that this were rights under the constitution. But the fourth one, fourth constitutional value on which I would like to speak is uh, uh, fraternity, which is not a right. Fraternity is actually a duty. That's why the constitution says fraternity ensuring, assuring, assuring, yes, fraternity assuring what? Assuring the dignity of an individual. That is why the, the dignity becomes very important. Woman who does a dignity. Any person has a, a, a dignity as an independent and individual. His individuality is his dignity. So the dignity of the person is very important as far as constitution of his concern. That is why we have uh, uh, so much, uh, we have laid, India has laid so much of emphasis on human rights because they are inherent, inalienable, indivisible rights of a person. Human rights. So without which there is no dignified life. So right to life means right to live, uh, right to lead a dignified life. And that is uh, what is dignity. So unless uh, you are in a position to lead a dignified life, there is no point in saying that, you know, I, I have life. My life is protected. What is protected is not the life that, you know, you are able to live in the sense, you know, you are breathing, you are eating and, you know, yes, that is not the sign of your life. Sign of your life as a free person in this country is that, you know, you have your dignity protected by the constitution. In fact, there are truly comes the unity and indignity of the country. Therefore, fraternity as a given as a duty, and uh, it is conceived <coughs> as uh, a constituting factor for the dignity, which is uh, cause, it's just so central to the, the constitution of India. So therefore, my dear friends, I only generally dealt with the constitutional values uh, in this regard, which uh, the preamble actually speaks about. And these constitutional values have been given expression in various uh, uh, parts of the constitution of India, various articles, where you know your right to live a constitutional way of life is protected. Uh, as I told you in the beginning, but for the constitution of India, India would not have been India because uh, the space and voice of everybody, irrespective of all the diversities, has been or have been protected and taken care of uh, by the constitution of India. So that, you know, everyone gets a feeling that India is my country. That's why our children always, you know, India is my country and all Indians are my brothers and sisters. So are all Indians our brothers and sisters? 12 years uh, we take a pledge in the, in the schools. Indians are my brothers and sisters. Can any of the sisters listening to me, sisters means my, 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 my article, uh, uh, they are, I don't mean reverend sisters, I'm saying the, the ladies. Can they walk uh, on the street at 9 p.m. alone? be it Delhi, be it Bangalore, be it anywhere in the country. Why do you say nine? Even a broad daylight also, if you walk alone, if you walk slowly, if you walk according to the way you want to walk, people start uh, looking at you as a commodity. As a commodity which is an object of uh, consumption. This is the way, because it affects your dignity. Your right to dignity and right to equality and equal treatment as men is not actually perceived by the Indian society. It's all, you know, you, 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 they, they, they the, the, the society by large, they want to deny this equality and deny this dignity on the basis of um, casteism, communalism, their uh, power, their money, their, uh, their, what you call, their muscle. 
that is not an india an india that the constitution makers conceived and dreamed of is an india where there is equal dignity for everybody irrespective of whether you are a man or woman or a transgender just as a man can walk in the street at 9 or 8 or 11 or 12 what makes what difference does it make if you are a lady if you are a transgender why you are looked at as a commodity because our mindset has been totally different you have always been seen or people want to see you as an object of uh, as an uh, as a commodity of consumption that's the mindset that we have to change i do not think that you know stringent laws with regard to punishment will make a change did the, the capital punishment uh, uh, in nirbhaya make a change here hatra should not have been there i am not saying naming in one place it happened to be reported but there are several several such uh, incidents uh, taking place in this country if you uh, just uh, go to the website of uh, national crimes records bureau you will find the horrifying statistics with regard to the crimes against women and children in this country is it because we do not have uh, adequate laws after nirbhaya person to justice verma committee report we the uh, indian penal code was amended and 302 to the punishment of uh, death was uh, incorporated in 376 subsections but uh, alas no change at all even on that day when this nirbhaya uh, uh, not execution but uh, the verdict came there was a more heinous crime reported here why do you say even lockout as hartras was in during lockout in jharkhand bihar up take any place you know a women women are not safe delhi any place anywhere in india they are not safe because their dignity and right to equality are not seen as valuable as they are enjoyed by the men there are several reasons sir this is this psyche which has to be changed so my dear friends i have generally and broadly dealt with all these aspects i am sure i am speaking to very enlightened community uh, and i need to give some time to you also to interact so i would uh, probably stop is almost 45 minutes which i started so i think yeah, 40 minutes or so so we can have a bit of an introduction without crossing any lakshman draga uh thank you very much sir i really appreciate the way you exposed the philosophy the fundamentals of the constitution preamble to the indian constitution linking it up very clearly with the fundamental rights excellent i really cherish this having coming from a law background i can see how much the value it is i mean the spirit is much more stronger than what is being said that's what you highlighted and secondly the way you articulated and presented particularly your tone and intonation when you spoke about vasudeva kudumbakam advaita the dignity of the person the constitutional morality i think you were completely in gross and you communicate the other message this is at the stake now we need to really look at it it's unwritten language you really articulated that i also like the way you spoke about in a very simple language talking about the space voice democracy uh, and how do we really make it the constitutional lakshman rekha not once more personal lakshman rekha but very very excellent now i can't really unmute everybody there will be a commotion i all, i'm already getting lots of questions so i'm going to bring some of the questions which the audience have posed uh, maybe some of the questions are repetitive so i'm putting them together the first question is i think one lady and one i have raised apparently there is a lot of fear among the citizens for various reasons the way the country is going around and this fear is really causing basically it dehumanizes you you are not able to exercise your personhood and your right as a citizen how do we handle this sense of fear which is fast spreading 
particularly among the lower sections of the Dalit Adivasis, uh, and to leave as citizens, how do we handle this fear? This is the first question I'm asking you from the audience point of view. Over to you, sir. Yeah, uh, it's a fact. There's no point in saying that there's no fear. There is a fear. Uh, uh, there's a, there's a fear of uh, some sort of insecurity among certain sections of the people, particularly as you said, you know the the Dalits, etc. Because you know repeated onslaughts are taking place into their uh, human rights. That's why the the so the the Dalits etc. have felt a bit of insecure. So let me ask you a counter question. When do I? Uh, what's the point which I start? Uh, um, getting this fear. I tell you when I have something to hide. If I have a skeleton in my cupboard, yes, I will always be you know, stooping my head, saying this like this only, and never like this. I don't discern because if I discern, yes, somebody will come and yes, take out your uh, skeleton. Those some so to be truly fearless. You need to be an, a, a, a particular, an honest citizen. Hmm? Skeleton free, yes. There should not be any skeletons in a cupboard, number one. Number two, whom are we afraid of? I would like to quote Shakespeare that the valiant never taste death but once. Two, three, how do we allay this? I can, it's very easy to um, um, preach on this insecurity. But how do we secure this, uh, uh, what they call peace to people, and how do we allay or uh, remove this fear of uh, this uh, Dalis of such people? Only by the people listening to me, or including me, our involvement in society by standing up with them and taking up their cause, telling them, you are not alone. Don't be afraid. I am with you. This is the way the mother tells you. The moment the child gets afraid, you know, what does the mother do? Mother says and hugs the child and says, don't worry, I am with you. Even if I am to lose my life, I will protect you. So we need to, we need to move close with them. And that is where you know, there are two organizations, two organs, which can probably play a great role. One is media and to the civil society movements. And unfortunately, the media in this country, I don't know, either they are opted to be silent or they are opted not to speak uh, the truth and you know, uh, exercise their, their real role in the nation building. Uh, and uh, or they are also afraid of, possible. And civil society movements. All civil society movements, you know, they have been uh, working very actively in protecting the, civil, the human rights of uh, people who have been denied these human rights. And all those people who, are, who have this feeling of insecurity are people who have been denied human rights. There's a correlation between these two, negation of human rights and insecurity. So we need to stand up with those people and I'm sure civil society movements uh, of a well-meaning public can take up, uh, take, take up their cause and you know, at least stand up with them and uh, raise your voice for them. That will, to some extent, uh, will tackle. And third is, we need to have a, a guardian who is conscious and who is constitutionally sensitized of uh, the rule. That guardian is the judiciary. The executive and the legislature may not interpret the constitution. But what the constitution is, what the constitutional right of free speech and free space is, is for the guardian to say yes. Though there may be attempted uh, uh, distortions on these aspects, but so long as the guardian is firm, guardian is unbiased, guardian is absolutely free, absolutely right, absolutely constitutional, and uh, whose, constitu whose conscience is absolutely constitutional, this country would be different and should be different. But unfortunately, people have started saying that uh, I've done everything my, according to my conscience. 
my conscience is not the conscience formed by his one's morality the moment you 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 swear as a judge of uh, the high court and the supreme court these are the two constitutional courts and mind you high court is not under supreme court high court also is a constitutional court just as the supreme court of india so these are the two constitutional courts in these two constitutional courts you know the the the, the oath the judges take that they will uphold the constitution and the laws this is the oath even the president of india does not take an oath like this upholding the constitution he only said defend the constitution but upholding the constitution and the laws is the role given to the guardian the court the supreme court um, i'm saying this let me confirm to supreme court the guardian guardian when i say supreme court let me take the high court also who are they afraid of they have a lot of constitutional protection they cannot be removed from their office a high court they can be transferred or they can be denied their promotion um, uh, as a pro- not promotion i will say elevation <laughs> as chief justice or a supreme court <coughs> otherwise you know in supreme court uh, the moment you are in supreme court your fate is sealed in the sense you know if you are senior enough normally you will become the chief justice you cannot be transferred from delhi to anywhere there is only one supreme court in this country there is no benches here so who are you afraid of so he takes a note the president takes a note that you know he discharge these duties without the fear favor affection or ill will if these four aspects are properly aligned in the conscience of the judge who takes this oath to uphold the constitution of india i can say there is a guardian and i can see that there is a guardian who i can look up to unfortunately and disturbingly painfully people are not able to say that so no that uh, that the credibility of the guardian also is shaken that is a disturbing factor not only this guardian credibility of uh, all constitutional institutions uh, have been shaken for the last quite a few years now this is actually the erosion of uh, the, the 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 glory of the, the constitution uh, the constitutional values in this country we have a lot of expectation on the constitutional institutions you take election commission you take uh, cvc you take the control cvc subsidiary creator statute but control and audit general of india is a constitution you take any such constitutional institution you take regulators made under the the the, the laws uh, uh, in the country take ugc take acdc medical council take bar council of india all regulators credibility is shaken so therefore you know if there is an alert uh, civil society movement that can be the, these tendencies can be arrested to some extent so these are the three modes i see as uh, solution yeah. thank you very much sir in fact while answering one question you have touched upon many of the questions and you have answered them because there are two questions which are coming in closely connected to our answer maybe if you have something to add you can add one is people are saying very clearly the citizen see the indian judiciary when they say indian judiciary the supreme court at the crossroads in the last few years and the various judgments that have come out simply shaking the citizens conscience where are we going that sense is strongly emerging on the other hand there are also questions related to saying the ngo civil society groups movements putting pressure on that but they are handled with a heavy high handedness this is a dilemma in which this country is seemingly moving in a, within a democratic uh, framework of the constitution would you like to say some light on that because i do not want to go to specificities but this is the general sense they are quoting number of things that are happening uh, what happens in different parts of the country different movements the dalit groups all that adivasi groups the corporates entering into this field Uh, without gram sabha's approval there are many things they are quoting uh, how do we really in a complex situation like this where do we go as citizens to protect our constitutional rights i cannot blame um, the common man uh, as far as your first question is concerned about uh, you know the the his uh, uh, about this uh, the, the the shaking of credibility in the supreme court of india look at uh, the type of case the supreme court of india handled during lockdown where there the real issues which the supreme court uh, should have handled 
That's number one. Look at the way the judges after retirement they take up, uh, uh, you know, uh, sites and assignments. That again shakes the credibility of uh, of the faith of the common man in that institution. Because your post conduct is, uh, you know, reflective of your past judgments. This is the reason. They will realize that you know this man was uh, uh, looking forward, and therefore. these judgments were so on so 1 2 3 4 because this came so because he was looking forward after his retirement so i can't blame a common man the way uh, the things uh, have been shaping in this uh, supreme court of india for quite some time now very unfortunate that we happen to come out to the street itself is another uh, reason when things were uh, not going uh, constitutionally and uh, the second part what is the second part panjo said but the there is groups and movements they are trying to yeah, defend yeah, an article yeah, yes yeah 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 i can only uh, tell you the story of tnmn square you know the youngsters youngsters they were told only one story all story of you know a fire in the valley and ants you know gathering and they saying you know what are we looking at it come on let's go to the mountain top roll ourselves and then roll down at least we can do this much problem is you know we don't involve ourselves our freedom fighters chose to sacrifice their lives chose to sacrifice their wealth health yes for uh, for others we have chosen to you know to be too selfish and self centric and particularly the, the law men i always uh, tell the supreme court lawyers they were so vocal and in those days supreme court uh, uh, you know were always positioned on the right uh, uh, positions but they also have chosen to be silent there are also division among them and none of the uh, renowned senior lawyers speak anything when things go wrong so the silence of law men has become worse than the violence of the lawless men or lemon that is another plight on this country so we can pray for them we can always uh, uh, ask them to speak out why don't they speak out thank you sir you mentioned about uh, clearly on the women's issues women's rights gender issues and i think there are a couple of questions coming around that uh, they say uh, we have seen what happened to derubaya atras and many other incidents that are happening and there is a scary atmosphere now how can us women's movement they should be able to sort of connect themselves and respond to this scenario they are still struggling how do we really help them to build an alternative narrative where women are not considered as commodities but they have equal citizenship rights as anybody else in this country they would like to hear on this yeah um i can speak uh, so many things about it but i i can tell you i can ask you one practical aspect of it see see look at the media advertisements how do they show women in this country the first uh, starting point of this commodity concept is actually through this uh, advertisements what has the women's movement in the country done against that even for the undergarments of men it's your uh, uh, what they call dishonorable pictures that are shown look at the condom advertisement they are also you know you are shown so for anything and everything it's it, those are those are advertisements affecting the dignity of womanhood of uh, the person what have we done against it you can ask a counter question what are the men done against it but if you don't feel that you know you don't feel offended probably the men would enjoy it because they want to enjoy it as a commodity but is your dignity that is affected as i spoke once i i gave a lecture to this uh, on this uh, on this in a in a college and after that you know, they went out to the street and to throw away all those uh, film advertisements and uh, you know they stopped uh, subscribing to many of the papers you know the many newspapers in this country 
their subscription rate depends on couple of pages uh, specifically earmarked for the semi nude pictures and you know vulgar uh, pictures look at the pornographic sites uh, while i was uh, as a sitting judge serving judge in the uh, in the supreme court uh, we had a case we banned uh, uh, you know we could get banned through the government of india 66 within hours thousands of sites came so we should be in a position to guide we should be in a position to sensitize we should be in a position to get ourselves into the right uh, positions if we want to fight against all those things so i'm just i just told you about two three practical aspects i can tell you so many things there is no point in saying the, the theoretical aspects and we need to create an real awareness in society as to the, the dignity which is which is equal to men and women that unfortunately is not going to the 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 mind of the men they it goes into the head that is the same front of yours who told years with uh, standing beside you said uh, you are my sister and when you are seen alone you are simply used as a commodity because it has not traveled to his conscience so the, the, it needs uh, you know uh, uh, what they call um, uh, a sense proper sensitization uh, in icf we used to so use this word conscientization yes um, like that you know we need to sensitize and and a lot should come from the uh, women's movements according to me a lot resistance a lot initiative uh, should come from them. thank you very much sir now there's one more question i'm combining two questions one milani matai raises about what you rightly said about the importance of article 19 the various freedoms that are given and he also the another person combining it uh, there are currently the writers poets uh, cultural activists and those who had free speech and those who were dissenting their voices are languishing in prison now this is a big message that is coming across all over the country even those who want to speak ultimately their voices are just cut off and they are not able to voice and they are asking what can help us at this point of time we want to speak but this is what it is is that the word that we can make to save the constitution to save our democracy yeah one uh, according to me it is the judiciary that should uh, i already referred to that aspect a guardian should take up this uh, danda as to what the constitutional position is as to what is free speech is and secondly it should form the grassroots rebel you should be in a position to to form your uh, movements in the panchayat in the ward level taking up your elected representatives taking up uh, you the people whom you voted for to stand up with you and you know get them also involved so they have a very important role i told the parliamentarians uh, a couple of days back in a speech that you know because the parliament chose to be silent we got to come to the street they also have a great role to play but unfortunately after getting our vote and getting elected their accountability becomes very 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 questionable so make them really accountable hold their hands pull them ask them to be with you and you know to be with you in securing your rights and building up a, a panchayat building up a village building up a constituency building up a parliamentary constituency etc so so they are getting them involved because they are democratically elected people they have the rights so getting them involved uh, right from the grassroots level of a panchayat you get yourself involved get into your panchayat get into your uh, um, um, whatever positions of elected uh, uh, avenues available please don't leave get into it and please ask people to vote or try people and who would stand for the people stand for the rights of the people this could be a couple of uh, my suggestions there could be many suggestions i'm not here to give you a panel but these are my 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 views on this uh, some of my views on these aspects i think uh, there are a number of because questions the, i think the, yeah. because in all, because in all these issues of uh, the suppression of voice and uh, uh, picturing voice as noise you don't find your elected people standing with you ask them to speak things will change you have wanted them with your vote only they have come what are they doing they should also speak i think i think you have given enough 
way forward enough of food for thought enough to wake up wake us up from our slumber I, and i know there are practical implications practical implications to it but i think you have stayed our conscience you have stayed our citizenship you have stayed us as human beings uh, uh, let me not take more time i think we are also we have enough space enough sort of an ambience to really think and reflect and work in our future on behalf of every one of you i want to thank justice joseph korean for really availing his time and to formally thank him and all of you may i invite sister janet who is the facilitator of the training programs in kerala i invite sister janet to propose for her thanks justice korean joseph and listeners from different parts of india men may come and men may go but the supreme court should remain forever the court of supreme justice we remember with pride and gratitude the statement of justice kurian joseph on prashant bhushan contempt court governments and leaders may come and go but the constitution constitution of the sovereign socialist secular democratic republic of india should always remain upholding the values of justice liberty equality and fraternity honorable justice kurian joseph we are so proud of you and we are very grateful to you for being so simple and clear but with fear but fearless with your examples you as a guardian of the constitution have proved once again as a compassionate human being a person with utmost compassion for poor and dalits oppressed and women thank you for your simple examples and for your clear statements in the name of indian social institute and all those who assembled through zoom we extend our heartfelt thanks to justice kurian joseph we have also a number of people to thank i remember with gratitude father joe xavier the director of the institute for his for all his effort to undertake and promote programs of social inclusion and democracy programs for to bring out peace and reconciliation for his able guidance and leadership thank you father joe xavier we remember with gratitude father joy james who is the friend of justice kurian joseph who is the reason for us to get for justice kurian joseph here for all his support and collaboration thank you for the joy we also remember with gratitude all those who are present here all the ngo heads and partners from south india the civil society members from different parts of india especially those from south india too youth and students teachers from different colleges and schools isi staff media persons i'm sure that all of you are influenced by this eminent speaker now it is our turn to turn our india with all these values of our country i last but not the least let me extend my heartfelt thanks to all the staff of isi all those who have coordinated and put their best to make this event a beautiful one thanks to all thank you thank, thank you and god bless you all thank you so much thank you god bless you to stay blessed thank, thank you thank, thank you so much for thank you for the brilliant joy presentation yeah. thank you for the brilliant thank presentation what will lead work thank it was so beautiful and useful to all of us wonderful thank you yeah. thank you thank, thank you. you i can see michael mathew also there yeah yes joins here so many people yeah, yeah. so many of you <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. This is enough. God bless all of you. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
thank you sister janet for your uh, brilliant uh, word of thanks it was really good and father joseph here too for all your uh, very well moderated the session and also with your uh, low background it was very good <laughs>